Mr. David Mulligan. I think this is, uh, is this working okay? You guys can hear that fine? First presentation of the morning, right? It's always, we, it's, I, you get the stragglers and everything. But, uh, um, so it, it's great to be here and thank you State Lands Commission, right, for inviting, uh, inviting me. This is, like I said yesterday, this is my first one here um, that I've been to one of these conferences. You guys do a, do a great job putting this on, so thanks again. Um, I'm gonna go through, uh, my the agency I represent is strictly pipeline, right? So I think in the other, uh, yesterday's uh, presentations you heard about the cleanup and um, you know the activities about the cleanup and everything our focus is strictly on the pipeline so once crude oil or whatever gets out of that pipeline um, I don't want to say we throw it over the fence but the other agencies take take control in terms of the cleanup and our focus is strictly on the pipeline what happened what could have been done to prevent it and how can we improve our regulations or our guidance with the uh, with the operators throughout the country. Um, so I'm going to go through the pipeline status. Uh, the conclusion of the failure investigation that came out, uh, I believe, in uh, mid-May, right at the anniversary date, uh, we completed our investigation, published that report, uh, and then CAO Amendment Number Three. That CAO stands for Corrective Action Order. It's a way that our agency puts certain action orders in place with that company that they must complete um, and, and there's a whole series of them amendment number three is just an amendment from the original corrective action order as we learn more right we publish those uh, uh, those orders uh, FINSA advisory bulletin uh, without going through the rulemaking process if everyone has been in government and going through a rulemaking process it is uh, very uh, laborious and very time consuming and usually what comes out of that rule isn't what necessarily what you thought it was uh, going in so uh, transition plan from interstate to intrastate um, and I'll kind of go through our memorandum of uh, understanding with the California State Fire Marshal on this line because it did change uh, kind of midway through the investigation and then the next steps right what, what is the uh, what's the next steps of the uh, Plains pipeline up there. Um, so right now, pipeline steps. Uh, line 901, and I have kind of a map. 901 is the one that, line that failed. It's about 10 miles long, going along the uh, the, the coastline north of Santa Barbara. Um, and then 903 is what takes it from the coastline all the way up into uh, near Bakersfield, um, getting away from the coast. But made up of the same material, different pipeline diameters but uh, still same construction modeling insulation and things like that uh, right now the both of those lines are purged with nitrogen so they're laid down in nitrogen and inert gas um, we completed uh, 901 was purged of crude oil right so there's no safety effects or, or anything internal corrosion in there um, it was purged right after this bill I'd say approximately probably a month after this bill is when they did the nitrogen purge uh, because they had to make some repairs to that pipeline before they could pressure it back up and, and do the purge. And then 903 was uh, was completed in uh, April of 2016 and that was done in two phases, um, actually three phases. And as you can see, this was, uh, it, it was a very challenging purge. Uh, you know, what we think uh, typically of a pipeline, emptying that pipeline and its contents are pretty, uh, pretty easy, done every day. This one was a little uh, difficult with the terrain. Uh, we had to utilize certain valves in place to, to throttle that nitrogen to push the pig. Um, and here's what it looks like, pipeline purge, right? So behind, we have nitrogen. So sitting up at uh, Gaviota Station was some nitrogen generators, right? Taking air, making nitrogen out of it. And that's what we used as the, uh, as the supply to push these pigs, right? Cleaning pigs along inside the pipeline. Uh, so you have the crude oil at first, and then a pig, and then in between there, it's called a water slug. Uh, 
a lot of barrels of water we used. One of the worries was, hey, where are you guys going to get the water, right? During that year, Santa Barbara and most of California was going through a uh, water shortage. Uh, they had a reverse osmosis uh, plant uh, at this station, so they just used to utilize that water and made it from the uh, ocean water. Um, and then the nitrogen, pretty cool process, right? They bring in these big things on skids and basically take air and make nitrogen out of it, so it's an inert environment. I stole this diagram from plane, so I'm not taking credit for building that, that little diagram. But I thought it represented a simplistic uh, representation. They did send this out to the public along that right away, so they knew exactly what was going on kind of a simp simple diagram and explain what the purge was going to be. All right, so what's impacted out there right now? So we have approximately, well, we do have uh, uh, seven platforms shut down, right? So these seven platforms, the only way they can move crude oil is through line 901, planes line 901, and up through 903. Um, so right now, these these uh, these three sets come into shore, and there are three actually three individual pipelines coming to shore from that last platform. Uh, they're all shut down, and they're either laid down in uh, I believe some are in seawater, and some have a uh, a biocide injected in there uh, with the crude oil to prevent internal corrosion. Uh, so what's bad about crude oil sitting there, right? It, if it's not moving, it's bad. It causes corrosion and everything, so we want to uh, fix things weird. Do keep on blinking off. Um, so Freeport McMoran, which was the longest one, uh, we had to empty that. So basically, Freeport McMoran comes in at Gaviota. And that pipeline runs all the way along the coast and then heads offshore to a platform, right? So there's three platforms out there. Well, they had all of these platforms were full of oil in between the uh, platforms and then coming to shore. So it was a very challenging first. These lines were shut down. So we said, okay, if we're going to purge this, let's purge all these lines feeding it. So it, it, Everyone was cooperative. Uh, we, we did a lot of work with State Lands Commission, Santa Barbara County, uh, Bessie, uh, and it was, a, it was a joint effort, right? And the operator, Freeport, Mac Moran, and Plains. <coughs> okay, conclusion of failure. Um, so after our report came out in May, no surprises, right? We just had to, uh, dot the I's and cross the T's, right, to put it in a formal report and everything. Um, what was happening during that morning when, when, the, uh, when the spill occurred is there was some maintenance happening up at Sisquak Pump Station, which is up north. Uh, this maintenance was, uh, it was routine. It was happening with, uh, uh, there was a pump overheating at first, so there was a technician up there working on that pump. And the control room operator down in Midland, Texas, that, that operates this line, was communicating with that with that technician, right? Okay, well, how, how's it looking? When do I start the pumps and everything? Everything okay? Uh, so they were going back and forth with that communication. Uh, so what we found out, though, is that communication or that maintenance up north kind of masked the situation. It was not the cause of the uh, of the leak or the failure. Uh, we found out it was a distraction for the control room operator, right? So he was kind of focusing up here, working with this guy, starting the pumps, stopping the pumps, but that did not cause the failure, uh, was not the root cause. It would have failed because they did not exceed their, uh, their maximum operating pressure when they were doing that. Uh, so it, sooner or later, our interpretation is sooner or later, it would have failed. Maybe in another hour, maybe in another day, maybe in another two days, if that operation was in there. Uh, the direct cause was external corrosion. So we classify corrosion in two forms, right? External, which is along the pipeline, it's corroding into the soil, right? Iron's going back into, uh, 
its native uh, components. And then internal corrosion, which is a lot to do with if it's uh, H2S, is a very corrosive environment. If they're transporting H2S, or if, they're, uh, if there's water in that crude, a lot of water, right? That's a corrosive environment. So they put inhibitors inside to, uh, to reduce that internal corrosion. Uh, but the direct cause was external corrosion. And I'll have some pictures, uh, original pictures of this pipe. Uh, so direct cause, then contributing causes. What we do is say, okay, if this one thing happened, what, what contributed, what made that happen? So there's three primary things that made that happen of the external corrosion. Uh, they had an ineffective protection against external corrosion. So what this means is our regulations require them to have a corrosion control program. In that corrosion control program, they must have cathodic protection. Basically what that is, is it's a current on the pipe, a very low voltage current or low amperage current that reverses the effects of corrosion. Uh, because of this pipeline was an insulated pipeline, so they had coating on it, and then up above that coating, they had a thin layer of insulation. Right? It's to keep the heat in. It's easier to transport when it's heated oil. Pumps don't work as hard, everything. They don't, have, they don't need as much pressure. Uh, under that coating, the cathodic protection system that was pushing the current, it couldn't get past that insulation and onto the pipe to reverse that corrosion. Uh, the next one was failure to detect and mitigate the corrosion. This is primarily running the SMART tools, right? The SMART uh, inline inspection uh, pigs uh, is that they weren't accurate. So what their readings were and the information they were getting out and their number crunching uh, with their vendor and themselves uh, if it wasn't giving them accurate data. So this 86% pit, right, that failed, only called out as a 40% pit, corrosion pit on the tool. Big difference, right? 40% is not even in a, uh, it, it, it's more of a, hey, we'll keep an eye on it, we may fix it in the next 180 days, but it's not an immediate repair. Um, and, and I know we all think, hey, 40%, that's pretty, pretty uh, good wall loss, but in terms of calculations and, and how the hoop stress works, it, it's, not that, it's not that much compared to, uh, we, we have eight, up to 80% in terms of immediate repairs. So that was another one, fairly detect and mitigate corrosion. And then that next one is lack of timely detection of the failure. This is primarily the control room responses, right? and what transducers and, and the information they gather off that pipeline. They didn't have enough eyes on that pipeline remotely, right? So pressure sensors, valves, what the pipeline's doing, and then also leak detection systems in terms of catching that. Uh, you gotta keep in mind, this pipeline is very, uh, the terrain it goes over, right? So they have a lot of hills, valleys, hills, valleys. So it's a very difficult pipeline to keep that liquid all in one place and, and pack. So to measure that, those pressures and everything, um, it, and this isn't the only one uh, pipeline that we, we have this in, but uh, it's very difficult to measure that, especially what is in and goes out, right? If it was a packed line flat, you'd know if you put one gallon in over here, you'd get one gallon out right away. It's not compressible. But in terms of pushing it up a hill and then it falling gravity, it's very difficult to uh, do leak detection. Okay, pipe failure pictures. Um, here on the left is, this is one of the first pictures um, that we have in our investigation report, uh, right on site. This is right when they got it uncovered and analyzed it in, it in the field. And then on the right was a picture from the labs in Ohio uh, third-party labs that were analyzing it is it's kind of a cleaned up uh, version of that uh, of that leak site. Is this one inverted to the other? Three? It looks like the one on the right is flipped up. It's upside down. It is. They look like flying bats, but one. Yeah. Okay. Like that was bats. that was my late night mistake, probably okay. with. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't flip it right. That's, that's why you don't do PowerPoint presentations at midnight. <laughs> okay, we're gonna break this down in terms of what we, 
ordered the pipeline operator to do, right, plane. Uh, we have two pieces, a remedial work plan, which was the original work plan, tells them, here's the studies you have to complete, right? Before you do anything with the pipeline, you must do a remedial work plan to gather more information. What's the condition of that line right now? Uh, so the first thing they were doing is investigating in remediation of the anomalies. An anomaly is, is something that a tool, it's, it's a, uh, it's a thing that uh, a pit that a tool called out, but it, it, they don't know what it is yet, right? Until they dig it up and actually measure it, they have sensor data compared to what's going to find in the field. So they try to map out certain fingerprints, right, that the failure site had, and said, where does this occur also on this tool run? Uh, and let's go look in there and see how accurate, if, if it is accurate in those situations. So they had to investigate that and still determine what was found and what the tool called out. Uh, now they had to work with their vendor very closely on this and give them the information back of what was found so they could fine tune that algorithm of that tool. Uh, so the data that comes out of a smart pig is just, it's just jumbo, right? To every one of us, it's the software and the algorithm that they use to interpret that data. Um, so the analysis of field measurements, that's what we were just going through. And then uh, regrading prior ILI data using an expanded set of interaction criteria. So every time they dug up a pit, an anomaly, they gathered more information, right, to, to see if any, uh, they had two runs of data they were comparing uh, from over the years. And the actuals compared to what was measured, uh, they could fine tune that algorithm. Then we have a uh, circumvential MFI, MFL, magnetic flux leakage ILI tool in uh, data integration. Um, so they had to integrate that data and then also the remedial work plan is additional anomaly investigations as necessary. So as they dug up more, maybe that fingerprint led them to more, more uh, investigations along the line. Um, emergency flow Restrictive devices, these can come in many forms. They can be a automatic shutoff valve, they can be a check valve, something that restricts flow under certain conditions and shuts down that line or blocks off that line quicker. So they had to do a surge study on that um, and see where their worst case was, right? If we put a valve here, what difference would it make in terms of barrels, a guillotine cut, and they, they had to, to look at that. Now that has been completed on line 903, and they're in the process of gearing up to put approximately four uh, remotely operated valves on there. Okay, so we have the remedial work plan, which sounds like, hey, they gotta do this before they, rest before they start up the pipeline. That's just the studies, and then we're gonna go into a restart plan. A restart plan is something not just restarting the pipeline, but that would include putting extra valves on, extra sensors, extra uh, uh, training, right, for their emergency responders and also their control room <coughs> operators. Um, so right now, just remedial work plan. And then we have to approve any restart plan when it's submitted. We have not received any restart plan to this date. Okay, so in progress right now. Implementation started in May for the remedial work plan of uh, 2016. Um, so right around the anniversary date of that spill. Ongoing investigation, um, eight anomalies, I believe. And Peter, you may know, these may have been completed last week. They have one remaining and they're having land owner issues. Landowner issue, issue? Yeah. okay. So anytime they go on the right of way, even though they have easements, they have to get approval to dig on you know, that landowner's property. Uh, especially if there's any artifacts or, uh, or things of that nature when dealing with uh, the different landowners. Uh, typically, almost on all these anomaly digs, we had representatives there. We also uh, invited a lot of the, whether it was the county or the state agencies along with us, if they wanted to participate in these anomaly digs, uh, they were more than welcome to, to tag along. So, uh, so just a sample of who uh, who tagged along during those uh, some of those anomaly digs. So we had 
Fire Marshal Bessie, Santa Barbara, and State Lands Commission. Um, so four out of the eight anomaly dig sites, uh, permanent repair. So, so at this time, when I got this slide from one of our representatives out in the field, only four of them were left. It sounds like seven of them are now complete, right? And we're just waiting on that one more uh, to be completed up there. And this is strictly on line 901, right? So we haven't even touched on nine, uh, 903. Uh, you know, a lot of delays were uh, encountered. They had a, uh, a Sherpa fire up there uh, in Refugio Canyon where the pipeline runs. So a lot of traffic control problems, access problems uh, during that time. And then, like we said, landowners and, and right away uh, issues to be worked out. In Santa Barbara County, every time that they have to dig, right, they need a permit. So they've been really cooperative in terms of that process, going through that process to get more information on that pipeline um, in, in, in doing that. Okay, amendment number three, which is our latest amendment, right? So we, as we gained more information from this failure report, we said, hey, we know more information. You're gonna have to do more stuff, planes, right, to put this thing, if you ever wanna put this thing back in service. Uh, so basically the requirements are, you know, it's additional requirements for line 901 restart plan. Improvements to planes integrity management program. This is because it's along the coastal area, they're in an integrity management plan. It's basically utilizing resources as risk management, right, to lower the risk on those pipelines in high consequence areas is the integrity management plan in a nutshell. Um, so they had improved that. Midland control room enhancements, including leak detection capabilities. Like I said, this line, they didn't have a lot of information on it in terms of feedback to the control center, right? They didn't know a lot of the pressures along that pipeline. They had the critical ones, but where this failed, it, uh, it didn't have that. I'm gonna jump along. So I'm gonna say long-term plan for corrosion prevention includes. So they have three <coughs> options, really. They can't put, as the existing pipeline sits, they can't put corrosion control on because um, it's an insulated pipeline. That current cannot get to the pipe. Um, so they can replace it, right? Dig it up, replace it, run a new one alongside steel that's not um, insulated uh, is one. Repairing or recoding, right, is, is another one. Uh, and then also a special permit. So because they are not within our regulations, they have to apply for a special permit uh, to say, hey, we're not gonna have corrosion uh, control or cathodic protection on it. Here's what we're gonna do to maintain the same level of safety. I got one minute left, so I see that. Um, remedial work plan, so restart plan, pressure restriction. This also said, hey, line 903 was a little different in terms of when we issued